No, I, just, just before I get to the story bit, um, there's this other thing, which I just realized, because we're talking about home and where you live, and I live in Amsterdam. And I found out why I like Amsterdam. And it's really simple, because if you go to another city, you see crazy things, and you say, that's crazy. But if you live in Amsterdam, you see an ordinary thing, and you think you're crazy yourself. <laughs> and, I, and I'll illustrate this. This afternoon, I was mocking my bicycle on my street, about to go inside, and then this couple coming uh, by. And what I heard was, Shlomlop Shabinella. And I thought, what? Shlomlop Shabinella. And I listened, and that's really what I heard. And I thought, they're joking. And then the guy, that's what the guy said, and the lady, she said, Shibbalala. And I thought, well, this is not a language. This is not what people say. But that's what I, I really heard this with my ears. And I, just as I, as I was about to panic, I realized, ah, oh, it's Amsterdam, it's Amsterdam, it's okay. <laughs> the time's come. So that, I just had to get that out of the way, you know, and now I'm free. All right, the story. Um, uh, every couple of years, uh, something happens, and all of a sudden, I find myself really thankful for simple things like friends, family, uh, food, uh, being alive, stuff like that. And this year, this year, uh, there was an incident that occurred. And after that incident, it was like I walked through a situation. When I came out, I had a sort of whole new appreciation for the world I lived in. And what happened was I had what you call an extended, highly concentrated, very, very, very bad day. This day was so bad. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing, but I was in the day. This day was, this day was so bad, it began the day before. It began the day before. Began the day before. And um, uh, the, 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 the catalyst for my horror, for my misery, was a library book. Okay. Now, back in the middle of spring, when the leaves were still green and fresh and people hadn't started complaining about uh, the heat, I was alone for a few days, I was alone for a few days, and time to kill, lots of fun, and I had absolutely no obligations, except for one little thing that I had to do, and I had to take the library book back to the library by Thursday, but that was days away, until it wasn't days away. It was uh, Thursday, 9.41, that meant I had 19 minutes, and I was at home alone, of course, in my speedos with two different colored socks. <laughs> so I had 19 minutes to get downstairs, get onto my bike, and race to the library. Um, something happened, maybe I was nervous, because when I was trying to get, you know, unlock my access slot, maybe I was, I was too energetic and it broke. It just broke, oh man, I think the key broke. And so I stood there and I was trying to get the key out. You know, when the key is in the slot, you can't pull it out, it's very hard to get out. I was trying to get it out, I couldn't get it out, and suddenly, it was 9.47, that meant I had 13 minutes to get to the library. And we live right in the middle of town, so it's technically easy to do this, but with 13 minutes, I knew it was a case of, you have to walk just below the speed of running with the occasional hop to keep your momentum going. So, so, so anyway, don't worry, I made it, I made it, I made it. Technically, I made it, I got to the library. The door was still open and people were coming out but nobody was going in. It didn't matter, it didn't matter. Because I'm the kind of, because I'm, I'm a big optimist and an open door means it is not closed. And so I went up to the door and I tried to get in with what we call the old left, right, left switcheroo. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, the lady letting the people out, she was more cunning. She was fast and she was stronger than I was. So her finger that jabbed me in the chest and kept me out of the library. This finger was like, was like steel, it was like a medieval lance. I, just couldn't, I couldn't get by, I couldn't get by, which was quite surprising. And um, uh, uh, mainly because she was small and she looked a bit uh, as fragile as a dragonfly. So I thought about it and I respected uh, her strength but still, there was something in me that said, the situation calls for an upgrade in my mood. <laughs> and so what happened next, I went through my complete catalog of facial expressions and body language poses, hoping to convince her to be merciful and let me into the library. I tried everything, I tried the, um, this dog wants a bone. <laughs> I tried, I'm such a sweet little lady. <laughs> she wouldn't let me in, she wouldn't let me in. And it was really annoying, I was furious. But at the same time, I had to sort of respect her willpower. If I had just 29% of that willpower, 
I would be a top class dictator. Really? I'd be terrible. I'd be terrible. But so, so the fact is, I stayed there and I was confused and I felt really bad. And she wouldn't let me in. And finally, when the last person came out, I was about to accept defeat. I was really about to accept defeat. I would have this close to accepting defeat. But she did something that was legal but quite unnecessary. She locked the door with a disdainful flourish. She went <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no. Yes, as you can see here, I'm the, I'm the father of two grown-up children. But at that moment, I couldn't take it. I gave her the finger. I shouldn't. It's a wrong thing to do. The one of you, the other, don't give people the finger. But I gave her the finger because I was annoyed that I stormed off home. I was just in a terrible, terrible mood. And I'm sure, as you can imagine, I could not sleep. The memory, the memory of the way she locked that door and looked at me, and the fact that I felt impotent. But there I was, a solid fellow, and I was unable to take a book back to the library. It, 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 it hurt, it hurt. And I tossed and I turned and I turned this way, I wasn't sleeping, until eventually there was only one thing to do, and the only thing I could do was put in the earphones and listen to my collection of Bob Ross statements. So I was to Bob Ross. And slowly and slowly I calmed down and became, yeah, I almost went to sleep. And the last thing I remember was sort of, pulling these headphones out and tossing them beyond it. Hours later I woke up, the sky was blue, the sun was bright, the birds were gossiping about the tourist situation, and I was full of energy, and full of just vitality, I felt really good, and the memory, the memory of yesterday was fading slowly, actually fading rapidly, and I felt fantastic, so I jumped out of the bed, but my heel landed on my earphone. And if the earphone, all oh, these things are terrible, it landed on the heel and the pain sent me up again in the backward direction. My head hit the wall, my body hit the bed, but I was okay. I was okay. This was spring, I was in spring zen mood. I was very calm. I was cool. I was cool when the wash gel squinted into my eyes and made me stumble and tear off the Shower curtain. I stayed cool. I stayed cool when the slices of bread I took out of the freezer because they were wriggly got stuck in the toaster and turned into 83% carbon. I stayed cool. I stayed cool when I got a metal fork and stuck it in the toaster to get the bread out. That I was shocked, but I was cool. 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 I was, cool. I was, cool. I was very cool. I was very cool. I stayed cool for a number of other events. I can't tell you about them because they were shameful and embarrassing. And I stayed cool until nine minutes over 10 when I got into the library with the book and I returned the book. That was one, I returned the book just like that. And you know how in retrospect, we're all so brilliant, we're all so wise. So as I returned this book, I paid the bill and I thought, what was the fuss all about? You don't get arrested for bringing a book late to the library. Of course you don't. So what was my problem? And suddenly with this newfound wisdom, I thought, hey, I'm going to get a new book and get even wiser. <laughs> so I went to get a new book. And I was wondering, and I found this fantastic book. Um, um, uh, it didn't break. It was paper. It was a wonderful book. And it was of these Sanufo sculptures. Sanufo Carmen. So I grabbed it, I thought, this is the book for me. I went downstairs and went to the borrowing, the library's borrowing machine, put the book in, and the machine pulled the book out again. So I put the book in, and it came out. It came out. So I put it in like this. It came out. I put it in like that. The machine spat it out and started screaming. And suddenly, everybody in the library is looking at me. Look at him, look at him, what's he doing? And I was say, no, I didn't do anything. It's the machine. And then from behind, someone said, Excuse me, sir. And I turned around. <laughs> oh, it was the lady. It was the lady from last night. And she was asking in a very loud voice, a, loud, a voice that was too loud as far as I was concerned, what have you done with the machine? <laughs> so I grabbed the book. I walked over to explain, open my mouth to explain what was going on. And she hit me with, the line is over there. <laughs> Burn! Man, that was terrible. She burned me, and everybody was looking and looking at that because he's been And I burned the line, they were looking at me as if I was wrong, and I hadn't done anything at all. And after about what seemed like 61 minutes of waiting in line, I finally get to this thing. And I step forward, and I take the book, and I want to say what's going on, and she ignores me. She just throws her hands out like this, as if, give me the book. So I gave her the book, and she grabbed it, 
And rather than find out anything wrong with the book, she started looking through it. She started looking. <laughs> to this kind of thing. <laughs> no. And so I stepped forward and I said, excuse me, I don't think that's what you should be doing. And you know what she did? The same disdain that she had yesterday, she hit me with that disdain. And she said, what? <laughs> now, that was a bad thing, a very bad thing to do because I'm a fragile, I look solid, but I'm actually very sensitive. And my inner Samuel L. Jackson <laughs> rose up. <laughs> Say what again? <laughs> Say what again? Oh. I dare you. I double dare you. <laughs> Say what one more time. Pow! She hit me. She's on the on the side of the face. Samuel Jackson and my courage jumped out of my right ear, got on the motorcycle, and drove out of the library. I was, look, I was staggering around. I was staggering around, and it was a touch-and-go situation. Would I lit stand? Would I fall? <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, when, when, when times are desperate, my imagination came in. My imagination grabbed hold of the wheel and drove along a staggering theme, and suddenly I was transported from the library in Amsterdam. Detroit, Michigan, <laughs> where I went by the name of Staggerman. Why was I Staggerman? Because I didn't walk, I staggered. <laughs> That's how I walked, I staggered. A typical scene in the morning in the place I lived, in Detroit, Michigan, would be me staggering along. 110 to 115 kids behind me, all staggering along, doing staggers to school. And then at the end of the day, we'd stagger back. And the great thing about this whole staggering was that in this particular form of reality, the staggering released creative enzymes in the brain. So all of these kids would grow up, grow up and do wonderful things for the community. Aww. And guess what? In this world, this super world that I was imagining, I was made time person of the year. Because I was staggering. I was so good at staggering around. The people thought, this guy is amazing. And I became that. And I started smiling, but obviously it was the wrong kind of smile. Or the lady in the library was a very violent human being because she backhanded me. What is this? She backhanded me, and my senses, my senses left. Common sense, all his cousins, they just split. Dude, we're on holiday, see you in two weeks. So there I was, without any sense. And a man without sense is like 10 litres of petrol and a lit match. A very bad combination. With, look, I'll just confess here, normally I'm normal. But under these circumstances, something happened. I thought it was Muhammad Ali for a moment. And she was George Foreman. And so I was thinking like, hey, Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. I went to sting, but I got stung. Something happened between this. I saw her fist hit me, and suddenly I was floating back to the air. The last thing I remember for a bit was her jumping over the counter, a bit like a chimpanzee jumps over an obstacle. And suddenly I'm on the floor, and she's got me in a headlock. <laughs> mommy, mommy, help! It came out of my mouth. <laughs> sense was gone. So it came out. It came out. It briefly followed by, by my dignity that slipped out of my mouth and slid away like a snake. It was shameful. And then some kids who should have been doing something else turned around. They were watching me. They're laughing. Ha 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 ha. What was that? And to make matters worse, to make matters worse, the security guys came and dragged me out. They didn't pick me up by the armpits and take me out. Had they done that, They'd throw me out of the library and I could have done one of those 30s gangster guys. You doity rats, get up. <laughs> no, these guys were so lazy. All they did all day was flirt with ladies and body slam that guy who kept trying to steal, steal books on her, her spiritual literature. They picked me up by the feet and they dragged me up. Can you imagine? And the worst part was going down the stairs because it's like, -ding -ding -ding. <laughs> I was outside, I was outside. And I slunk away, but it's very hard to slink away like a thief in the afternoon. Everybody sees you. Ha 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 ha. Everybody was laughing at me. So I disappeared and I walked and I walked in total shame. I walked 13 times around Amsterdam in complete shame, dripping with shame. Sometimes I take on my shame and throw it on someone. <laughs> <laughs> it was too much shame. I couldn't take it. I couldn't take it. Eventually, I found myself on the Zaydai. I was on the Zaydike, I was staggering, not like Stagger Man, but I was staggering like a broken human being. I was staggering, I was staggering, and suddenly, 
the very thing I didn't need, the very, 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 very thing I didn't need were my enemies. And I want you to think of the person, the people, your super, super, super duper enemy, multiply that by 63, divide it by seven, and then you have how I felt. And my enemies were those little white dogs that old ladies love. <laughs> it's not personal, it's genetic. Gee, that's the way I'm made. I don't like those dogs. Those dogs don't like me. We see each other. <laughs> so I'm standing when there are three of them, a trio of these dogs. And one of them stands in front of me and it's got all this attitude. Oh. <laughs> you know, like the dog is so small. But it's a... <laughs> and, and I know I shouldn't have done it, but I was tired and I'd been had a very bad day, so I kicked it. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Oh, calm down, please. I kicked it, but I missed. <laughs> That's very good. I kicked it, I missed. The three dogs, the three dogs had teamed up and had some doggy moves that I didn't know about. <laughs> they tied my legs and did a U-turn. Suddenly, I'm airborne, and the last things I said before landing was Deary Honda, which non-Dutch people means bad doggies. <laughs> I landed on the ground. The dogs were yapping and yapping and yapping. Over there, there was about seven Italian tourists who were on those red bikes. And they stopped and said, hey, this is a crazy man. <laughs> <laughs> the first one of them, one of them, besides he's like, Bellini, he's like doing all this stuff. What? I'm on the floor. The dogs are attacking me. And then to make it even worse, even worse, the old ladies came in with their sticks and their shoes. And let me tell you, if you're going to fight old ladies, I'm not saying you should, but if you are, don't let them get you on the ground because those shoes have got the kryptonite in the youth. And I was in agony. I was in agony. I was screaming there. And in the middle of my screaming, this restaurant on the other side, the door opened. 978 Chinese people came out, they dropped their food, came out, and they started filming me. They thought it was wonderful. They said, oh, Amsterdam's a great city. It's a perfect city. Oh, the shame and the agony. I was broken. I was weeping. I didn't want to weep, but I was crying. And then suddenly a funny thing happened. I heard these voices. There were these voices, and everything went away. The old ladies were thrown across the side of the road. Don't worry, they bounced and stood up immediately. <laughs> the three dogs were tossed to the old ladies, landed on their heads. <laughs> the Italians calmed down, the Chinese went back in, and suddenly I found myself surrounded by two fine Dutch women. Four meters, 19. <laughs> Four meters and 38 on that side. And they had these deep voices. Excuse me, I'm just perspiring. The shock. It's the shock. We don't get that. And the first one said, Oh. Hey, all right. The other one said, Oh. And they introduced themselves to me. The first one was called Brittany. Brittany Spears. The other one was called Jennifer, like Jennifer Lorbis. And so these two fine ladies picked me up and they said, Are you okay? And I said, Yes, I'm all right. And I sat there, I stood there, between them, my arms around their knees, <laughs> and we looked out at Amsterdam, and we looked out at Amsterdam, we saw people fighting with tourists, we saw people nudging themselves one way or another, and I thought, this is okay, this is okay, I'm alright, this is home, and I was home. <laughs>